This week on Rugged Expeditions, we're hunting the jagged Taurus Mountains of Turkey for trophy Bezor Ibex. And along the way, we're gonna take a gander at some of the ancient Lycian tombs. I'm back! Wow. This episode brought to you by Choice Ammunition, Uncompromised Precision. I don't think you can really call Turkey a third world country. Turkey is a modern place. Istanbul is a thriving area. And even when you get out in the countryside, the people are well fed. You don't see a lot of abject poverty like you see in most of Asia. Turkey is a great place to go and see, whether you're hunting or just going as a tourist. There's a little bit of everything there, and its ancient history, it's amazing. It was great to be able to walk around these fantastic Roman ruins. Actually, in Turkey, you really can't call them ruins. Most of them are still intact. It was amazing to be able to see how they built it, how it's been chiseled out of stone and all that rock moved into place to create this fabulous amphitheater that held innumerable events in ancient times. It's really something to behold. Aspendos was an ancient city in Asia Minor and is known for having the best preserved theater of antiquity. Built in 155 by the Greek architect Xenon, it was periodically repaired by the Seljuks, who used it as a caravansary, and in the 13th century, the stage building was converted into a palace by the Seljuks of Rum. The high stage served to seemingly isolate the audience from the rest of the world. Part of enjoying the culture of any place you go is going to the local market. Wow, they got all kinds of goodies. Try this. Yeah, that's a sample. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, it's made out of honey and pistachios. Gives you a lot of power, like a real man. Like that kind of power? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's really good. What do they call this stuff? That's called Turkish Delight. Turkish Delight? Yes. I thought that was that girl we saw oh, here. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of smells and sights and action going on, the vendors hawking their wares, whether it's the vegetables or going to the fish market. It's always exciting. That's the great thing with Istanbul, being right on the ocean like this. They've got all kinds of fresh seafood and good eating. What a place. Looking at all this fish makes me hungry. I'm looking for something for my uh, girlfriend for uh, Christmas. Uh, you know, it's coming up in two weeks there in America, and mm -hmm. she's really hard to buy for, And but uh, she likes fancy clothes and that. You got anything like that I around here? Something. How about Bag, this? Or maybe by dancing outfits. Hey, look oh. at this. What do you think about this one? Now we're talking. Like ah, belly dancer, right? Look at this. Ah, this is... I'm thinking, yeah, that's really... Uh, that's really her too, the whole belly dancer thing. Yeah, that could work out good. I've hunted with Shikar Safari several times. They always put on a good show. And when we were in the Taurus Mountains, we had real pros with us. These guys live there in this steep mountains. They're out there every day. They're looking for Ibex. They know this place like the back of their hand, and that comes in handy. The Taurus Mountains of Turkey are heavily wooded with some openings where you've got cliffs where these Bezor Ibex live. 
The Bezoar Ibex is considered by many to be the most beautiful of all the Ibex, if not all the mountain animals. With their gorgeous hide, those big sweeping horns, they've got that black cross across the top of their back. It just doesn't get any prettier than the Bezoar Ibex. Glassing from the jagged Taurus Mountains, Alan Smith and his guide Kam Karakaya from Shikar Safaris are in pursuit of trophy Bezoar Ibex. Finding them in the timber of the Taurus Mountains is a real challenge. You're glassing into the nooks and crannies. You never know where you're gonna find one. One of the great things about getting to go hunting in all these oddball places is you never know what's around the next bend. Here in Turkey, we come off the mountain. We're heading down to where we'd left the vehicle to drive back down into the village. And all of a sudden, we come to this opening, and here's these big stone tombs carved out of solid rock, ancient. When I first saw them, I had no idea who had even been there and put them in place? Wow. You can see this one's got writing still on it. These tombs here are from the Lycia people, one of the early settlers here on the Turkish coast. This is incredible. These are all carved out of solid stone. And then you can see the lid of the sarcophagus that was slid over the top how they got here and were moved. You can see the size of the chunks is beyond belief. They brought them up here to keep them away from the coastal areas, which were always getting raided. What an added treat to a Ibex hunt. The Lycia believed the souls of their dead would be transported from the tones to the afterlife by a winged siren creature. I'm back. This would be a great place to be buried. Maybe you could get a statue of yourself in front of it too. Maybe like riding a horse or something. Big old spear, big stud horse. Fancy helmet on. That'd be cool. This rain has got to let up sooner or later. The animals have gone into the caves and that and under the brush. We're seeing a couple now, but this needs to let up, otherwise it's just going to be getting wet and wasting time. We've come up here to this house in the village. One of the guys lives here with his family and we're having a little warm-up session and dry out. This is nice. In Turkey, meals are a family occasion. Everybody gets together, you spread the food out, and people dig in and help themselves. Whether it's cutting a chunk of salami, a piece of cheese, it's a great way to eat, you get a little camaraderie. You get to spend some quality time and get to know your guys. Turkish tea is not only known worldwide for its strength and the great flavor, but it's also known for the caffeine kick it's got. And when you're up on the side of a mountain, a little tea goes a long way to put some energy back in your step. Why well, we found a big one up in here. We're hiding out in the rain, waiting for it to open up up here, and the clouds have just disappeared up here on the side of the mountain. We've seen one that, conservatively 47, 48, maybe a little bigger, a real one. And he's in an area where it looks like we could get up through these rocks and get up high, but now he's disappeared over this top, so. At least they're here.
Hunting in the Taurus Mountains is a challenge. It's got a lot of heavy timber. It's steep, unbelievably steep. So getting around, being able to climb in there, glass in there, it's tough. Hunting in the treacherous Taurus Mountains, Alan Smith and his guide Khan Karakaya from Shikar Safaris scan the opposing cliffside for any sign of huge bees or ibex. A lot of glassing is required to find these ibex. You spend hour after hour glassing down into the canyons, across to the other mountains, just to try and get a glimpse of them. Luckily, they're fairly light colored, so if you do see them in among the rocks, they usually stand out pretty good. If there's ever a hunt that good optics are the key, it's when you're hunting ibex in those cliffs and in those mountains like that, trying to search out just one little patch of white, maybe a tip of a horn, the flicker of an ear. That's where these good binoculars and spotting scopes more than pay for themselves. The trick was to get into a good position just as the sun was coming up and try and catch these bezoar ibex out on the cliffs still trying to get some sun on them. Once it got to be full daylight, the ibex had gone back in the timber. You weren't gonna find them once they'd laid down in that thick stuff. That's when we'd have our lunch. Hopefully it wouldn't be raining, we'd get to sit in the sun. We're taking a break from the hiking and glassing. We've seen a couple small ones, but even by the last day standards, they're not quite up to last day standards. But uh, we're getting there. Yummy. Hey, there you guys. How about that, a little art with oranges? No, it's an elephant. What'd you think it was? You guys. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I've always found that a polystyrene plate thrown onto the fire really adds to the flavor of your tortilla. Apparently likes it. After several days of tough hiking through the Taurus Mountains, Alan Smith and his guides are optimistic that the team will find the huge trophy bees or ibex that they've been looking for. Luck's turning our way. We've got the sun this morning. It's cool, it's crisp. We've come back to the same valley where we were at the last couple days where Mr. Big lives. He's been hiding out on us, so I think the rain made him go back into his cave and hang out there. These big billies will go in there and stay out of this weather. He's probably done with the rut. There's a few young ones still running around that we're seeing this morning, but we haven't seen Mr. Big yet. But it'll be time anytime now. We'd gone to several different places to look for this one specific big ibex that they knew of. They hadn't seen him in a couple weeks. But these bezoar, from what they were telling me, tend to hang in the same general vicinity. Going back into a spot where we've been earlier in the week, the guys thought he's gotta come out sooner or later. So we went back in, climbed down this steep, steep cliff, found ourselves a little niche that we could hang out in, and all the guys started glassing in different areas.
When he finally did appear, he was right on an open cliff face and had been laying there all day behind some logs and we just hadn't seen him. When I first set eyes on him, I realized this is the trophy of a lifetime. A Bezor Ibex in this category is few and far between and it was something to see him walking across that side hill with that white and that big black cross across his back, just easing along all by himself. Last day, 310, 486 yards. He was going across that side hill. There's no way. When he was standing behind that log, I almost took a poke at him. I thought, if he turns right now, I'm not, I'm not gonna make it. And he stepped right up there. Whew. Now we got our work cut out for us. We gotta go all the way over there. He fell down in that canyon over there. Go ahead. Made it over. I'm not sure how the guy running this camera's getting over, but. Here he is. Oh, baby. Oh, yes. Four trips to Turkey and finally a Bezor. Oh, and a dandy, too. Look at the horns on this. Look at the one. Oh boy, this is a nice old one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven years old. Eleven and just massive. Look at these big knobs. Whoa! Big knobs they got on them. Been all fighting, he's all chipped up. This one here. Man, what a trophy. Look at the coloration on him too all in their fall mating colors, showing off for his girlfriends. Although he won't be showing off anymore. Oh, you can see this terrain we're in behind us. It's unbelievable where these things live. We got a shot at him right up here and he fell down to these rocks and ended up down here, but he didn't break his tips off or anything. Still in good shape. Wow, what a culmination to a fantastic safari here in Turkey. Getting to put your hands on a tremendous trophy like that, almost 50 inches of horn, is what makes all that climbing and all that work worthwhile. Getting to do it in a very exotic locale is just an added bonus. The people that you get to meet, the culture you get to experience, makes all the travel and all the headaches worthwhile.